Chapter 14 Callie uttered a cry of disbelief and went charging down the hall toward her mother. Mom, are you hurt? Dad, hurry! Mom needs help! I... I'm not hurt, Mrs. Fraser said, pushing at her blood-soaked hair with both hands. I'm not hurt. The blood... Cody and Mr. Fraser burst into the hallway, their faces reflecting their alarm. Cody let out a horrified shriek when she saw her mother. Callie saw the color instantly drain from her father's face. His mouth dropped open, and he started to choke. I'm not hurt, Mrs. Fraser cried. It just... dripped on me. Callie and Cody rushed to hug their mother, but Mrs. Fraser hung back. What's that smell? she demanded. Callie, what is that all over you? I... I don't know, Callie stammered. Beth, are you cut? Mr. Fraser finally found his voice. The blood. It tripped on me. From the ceiling, Mrs. Fraser explained, pointing with a trembling hand to their bedroom. They ran to the bedroom. Callie clicked on the light. She uttered a low gasp as she saw the dark puddle of blood on the ceiling above her parents' bed. The blood was trickling down in a steady stream, splashing onto the pillows and sheets. I heard Callie screaming, Mrs. Fraser said, lingering at the doorway, gazing up with fear in her eyes at the huge circle of blood. I started to get up, and then I realized... She gestured to the bloodstains on her nightgown. It must be coming from the attic, Mr. Fraser said. He grabbed his glasses off the dresser top and struggled to steady his hands enough to put them on. There must be something in the attic. He hurried past Callie's mother, heading toward the attic stairs. No, don't go, Mrs. Fraser screamed after him. Don't go up there! But Callie heard the attic door open, then heard her father's heavy footsteps as he climbed the stairs. I can't find him, James cried as he burst into the room. I can hear Cubby, but I can't find him anywhere. Sobbing, he buried his face in his mother's nightgown but he jerked his head back when he felt the wetness. Mommy? I'm okay, Mrs. Fraser assured him. I'm not hurt. I, I've got to take a shower, Callie moaned. This stuff, it's so gross. The smell is making me sick again. Where's Daddy? James demanded. Callie raised her eyes to the ceiling. She could hear her father's footsteps over her head. Is Daddy up there? James asked, wiping tears off his cheeks with both hands. Mrs. Fraser nodded. Something is dripping, she pointed to the ceiling. The footsteps in the attic stopped. A heavy silence fell over the bedroom. Everyone listened. Silence upstairs. No footsteps. Not a sound. Oh no, Cody moaned. She turned and ran out of the room, heading down the hall to the attic stairs. Callie was right behind her. Daddy, are you okay? She shouted up the stairs. Silence. Daddy? Callie stared up at the steep, dark stairs. Then she turned to Cody, her eyes wide with fright. Why doesn't he answer? Chapter 15 Daddy, are you all right? Can you hear me? Callie's thin voice echoed up the steep stairs. She breathed a loud sigh of relief as her father appeared at the top of the stairs. Pressing his hands against the walls on both sides, he came down slowly, one step at a time. When he stepped into the light, Callie saw that his expression was dazed and confused. Daddy? She started to say, taking his hand. It was as cold as ice. Heads, he murmured, trembling all over. He blinked several times, as if trying to blink away what he had seen up there. Huh? What did you see up there? Mrs. Fraser demanded from the bedroom doorway. Ha, heads, Mr. Fraser stammered, his eyes dancing wildly. Three human heads. A woman. Two children. No, no! He let out a wailing sob. With a shudder, Callie glanced up the stairs. No, her father screamed. Don't look. Don't go up there. So much blood. The heads. The poor heads. Call the police. Hurry. Somebody. Call the police. After the police officers finished their search, Callie showered for nearly half an hour. But no matter how much she scrubbed, the sour smell clung to her. Why couldn't the police find anything in the attic? Callie wondered. Why couldn't they explain the bloodstains on the bedroom ceiling? A doctor had been called. He gave Mr. Fraser something to calm him and help him sleep. Poor Daddy, Callie thought. When the doctor left, Callie's mother had also taken a long shower, trying to wash away the dark, caked blood. The two sisters and their mother worked for hours to clean the disgusting green liquid off the sink and bathroom floor. When they finished, they all showered again. Pulling a robe over her fresh nightshirt, Callie made her way downstairs to get a cold drink. The kitchen clock revealed that it was nearly five in the morning. Callie could hear her mother in the den with James, 
speaking in low, soothing tones, trying to calm the poor boy. Callie listened for Cubby's barking, but all she could hear now was the hum of the refrigerator and her mother's low voice from the den. As she poured herself a glass of orange juice, Cody wearily entered the kitchen. It's a little early for breakfast, she groaned, but pour me a glass, too. Callie still felt shaky. She nearly dropped the glass as she handed it to her sister. Now maybe you'll believe me about this place, Cody said, her green eyes locked on Callie's. Callie felt a cold chill run down her back. She nodded solemnly, unable to hide her fear. Yeah, maybe I will, she whispered. But, Cody, what can we do? I'm going to talk to Mr. Lorry, Callie's father said. He had to know about the weird problems with this house. If he refuses to make everything right, I'm going to demand our money back and ask him to tear up the mortgage. It was a little after ten now. The family was sitting around the kitchen table, yawning, resting their heads in their hands, trying to choke down toast and tea. Only Mr. Fraser had slept, thanks to the doctor's medication. The others had been too frightened to return to their rooms, and Mr. Fraser had stretched out on the couch in the den. Callie stared across the table at her father. His eyes still darted around rapidly, and he was breathing hard. He talked quickly in a breathless voice Callie had never heard him use before. He kept muttering crazily about the three heads and the police. He should lie down, Callie thought, worried. He isn't really making sense. He isn't ready to be up. Callie had called the boutique and explained that she couldn't go into work. Luckily, the inventory hadn't been completed, and Callie's new boss didn't need her. I can't believe I'm missing my first day of work, Callie said, shaking her head. But I can't go to town while things are so crazy. Are you sure you should go out, dear? Callie's mother asked timidly, squeezing her husband's hand. I have to, Mr. Fraser insisted. I have to find out what Mr. Lorry is going to do about her trouble. Mr. Lorry probably didn't know the story of the house, Cody said quietly. Despite Callie's reluctance, Cody had told her parents the frightening story that Anthony had revealed. Both parents had reacted with disbelief. It can't be true, their father had murmured, his face still as pale as a ghost, bodies buried, unmarked coffins, the heads, the three heads. Mrs. Fraser had remained silent, chewing her bottom lip, her eyes narrowed. Now, as the morning light filtered through the kitchen window, Mr. Fraser muttered to himself, his lips moving rapidly, his eyes unfocused. Mr. Lorry had to know the story, the horrible story, he insisted. He told me he's been a real estate agent in Shadyside for more than 30 years. I'm going to give him a call right now. He pulled out his wallet, searched through it, then pulled out the real estate agent's business card. Hmm, that's strange, Callie's father murmured, squinting at the card through his glasses. What's strange, Callie demanded. There is no phone number on his card. Mr. Fraser handed the card to Callie. Can you find one? Callie studied the card. In small, engraved letters, the card read, Jason Lurie. Real Estate, 424 Beer Street. Callie handed the card back to her father. Just an address, she said. Mr. Fraser climbed to his feet and walked over to the wall phone. Callie turned at the table to watch him. He punched in information. Could I have the phone number of the Jason Lurie Real Estate Agency? He asked, leaning against the kitchen wall. It's on Fear Street. A long pause. Then Callie saw surprise on her father's face. There is no listing, he asked into the receiver. Are you sure? A moment later, he replaced the receiver and returned to the table, shaking his head. I never heard of a real estate agent without a phone, Mrs. Fraser said, staring into her teacup. I'm going over there right now, Mr. Fraser declared, frowning. I'm not going to spend another night in this house until I talk to him, until I find out the truth about this house. And make him find Cubby, too, James insisted, pouting. Mr. Fraser patted James's disheveled hair. I don't think Mr. Lurie can do that, he said softly, but we'll find the puppy, James. I know we will. Can I come with you? Callie asked. She realized she didn't want to leave her father on his own. Mr. Fraser nodded. Yes, come with me. I can use the moral support. Hurry back, Callie's mother called after them. Don't leave us alone here too long, okay? Callie took a deep breath as she let the fresh air caress her face. Then she climbed into the blue Taurus beside her father. The car crunched down the gravel drive. When they backed into the street, out from under the blanketing trees, the sun appeared. Callie saw that it was a warm, beautiful day. It's a short drive, her father said, the sunlight reflecting off his glasses as he guided the car slowly down Fear Street. What's the address again? 
He had given the card to Callie. She read the number off the card. 424. She watched the old houses pass by. Many of them were set far back from the street, half hidden by tall hedges and shrubs. As he drove, Mr. Fraser kept clearing his throat and tapping the wheel nervously. Poor Dad. He's in such bad shape, Callie thought. Whatever he saw up in the attic last night has totally changed him. The Fear Street Cemetery passed by on the driver's side. Beyond the fence stretched crooked rows of white tombstones, gleaming like bones in the bright sunlight. Callie held her breath until the cemetery rolled out of sight. That was one superstition she and Cody agreed upon. Always hold your breath when you pass by a graveyard. It should be on your side, Mr. Fraser said, clearing his throat. Keep an eye out, Callie. He slowed the car. See any numbers? Callie squinted up at the mailboxes along the street. That one is 400, she said. It must be on this block. Mr. Fraser slowed the car to a crawl. What's that number? Callie squinted hard at the mailbox in a tilted pole. That's 410, she announced. They passed the next house, a tall stone house with an old-fashioned looking turret that made it resemble a castle. That's 422, Callie told her father. So it's got to be the next one. Okay, Mr. Lurie. Ready or not, here we come, Mr. Fraser declared. He pulled the car to the curb. They both peered out of the passenger window and gasped. It's an empty lot, Callie said. Chapter 16 They both stared out at the tangle of tall weeds, low shrubs, and wild grass. There's nothing here, Callie whispered. Mr. Fraser cleared his throat nervously. It, it must be the next one, he stammered. He pulled the car away from the curb and edged slowly down the street. The empty lot ended at the corner. A large brick house rose up behind a tall hedge on the corner of the next block. This has got to be Lori's office, Mr. Fraser said. Callie leaned out the window. No number, she said. Oh, wait. She spotted a low wooden address sign at the bottom of the hedge. It's 426. But that's impossible, her father cried shrilly. He grabbed the business card from Callie's hand and studied it. Then he backed the car up slowly, checking the numbers on both sides of the street. An empty lot, he said, sighing. An empty lot. His weary voice revealed his defeat. Hey, I've got an idea, Callie said, brightening. Anthony told us about the town historian from the library. Maybe he's still working at the library, and maybe he'll know where we can find Mr. Lorry. Callie's dad gazed at her. His expression frightened Callie. He seemed so far away, so lost in his own thoughts. She wondered if he had even heard her suggestion. She felt a little relieved when he finally said, Okay, it's worth a try. But his voice sounded strained, and his eyes still seemed focused somewhere far away. We gave Lori all our money, he muttered more to himself than to Callie. Every penny went for the house. Every penny! They had to drive around for quite a while before they found the Shadyside Library, a square red brick building in the North Hills section of town, three blocks from the high school. A gray-haired woman at the front desk carefully stamped half a dozen books, checking the date on each one before raising her eyes to acknowledge Callie and her dad. Can I help you? We're looking for a man who is a town historian, Callie told her. Does he work here? You mean Mr. Stuyvesant, the woman replied curtly. Reference room. She pointed down the hall, then returned to stamping books. Mr. Stuyvesant, dressed in a white shirt, a narrow yellow tie, and black trousers, sat hunched over a small metal desk that stood in front of the card catalog. As Callie approached, she saw that he was nearly bald except for a tuft of white hair just above his forehead. He had a round, red face, a thin, pointed nose, and tiny black eyes, which reflected the blue glow of the computer monitor on his desk. He flashed them a pleasant smile as they came close. This is the reference room. May I help you find something? Well, we're hoping you can help us find someone, Mr. Fraser said, his voice echoing in the empty room. Someone told us you were the town historian, Callie said. Mr. Stuyvesant seemed pleased by this. His smile widened and his face grew even redder. I take a special interest in Shadyside's past, he said with obvious pride. We're trying to find a real estate agent, Mr. Fraser said impatiently. The librarian's smile faded. Have you tried the yellow pages? Mr. Fraser blushed. You don't understand, he said irritably. We're trying to find a man named Jason Lurie, Callie interrupted. He is the man who sold us our house. We thought you might have some kind of town directory. I am the town directory, Mr. Sylvester posted, his tiny black eyes sparkling. I know just about every business in Shadyside. People say I mind everyone's business but my own, he laughed a high-pitched giggle at his own joke. 
Have you heard of Mr. Lorry? Callie's dad asked, his arms crossed in front of his chest. Mr. Stuyvesant wrinkled his bald forehead. You sure you don't mean the Lowry Agency? They're over on Division Street. Lorry, Mr. Fraser repeated. Jason Lorry. Hmm. Mr. Stuyvesant rubbed his chin. Lorry, Lorry, it does sound familiar. He stood up from his small desk chair. He was a big man and had to push himself up with both hands. He made his way to the shelf behind his desk and picked up a large book. This is the current business register, he said. He set the book down on his desk and, leaning over it, his face just an inch or two from the book, began thumbing through the pages. Judson Lorry? No, Jason, Callie's dad replied, frowning. Jason Lorry. Nope. Mr. Stuyvesant slammed the book shut. Not in Shadyside, he scratched his bald head. Let me check something for you. He made his way back to the shelf and returned with a larger volume, bound in dark leather. The worn cover indicated to Callie that the book was quite old. This is a historical record, Mr. Stuyvesant told them, setting it down carefully on the small metal desk. It's my own personal record. I've kept it myself since the early 50s. Let's see if your Mr. Lurie exists in here. Breathing noisily, Mr. Stuyvesant began searching through the big volume, running a finger down the columns. Callie and her father stood impatiently on either side of him, watching the librarian as he made his way through several pages. Suddenly, his finger stopped. He lowered his face even closer to the page, and his lips moved silently as he read. When he raised his eyes to Callie and Mr. Fraser, the color had drained from his face, and his tiny eyes were wide with shock. "'What's the matter, Mr. Stuyvesant?' Callie asked. "'Well,' the librarian hesitated, "'I have a listing in here for Jason Lurie, but it isn't quite what you'd expect.' Read it. Please, Callie's father urged. Mr. Stuyvesant lowered his face to the book and, moving his finger over the page, began to read in a quiet voice. Jason Lurie, real estate agent. In July of 1960, he found his family murdered in a new house he had built for them, hanged himself one month later in the same house. House located at 99 Fear Street. Chapter 17 Dear Diary, we're all so frightened now. We want to move away from here to leave this house as fast as possible. But Dad says we don't have the money to go. Poor Dad has been acting so strange. He has a faraway look in his eyes all the time, as if he's so upset, so lost in his own disturbed thoughts that he can't focus. And I caught him talking to himself twice today. He was pacing back and forth in the backyard, talking out loud to himself a mile a minute. He was muttering something about Simon Fear and bodies buried in the basement, that really gross story that Anthony told us. He was muttering about Mr. Lurie, too. I'm so worried about him. I'm worried about James, too. Mom and Dad signed him up for a day camp. I think mainly to get him out of the house. When the bus came to pick him up, Tuesday morning, James refused to go. He cried and carried on. Not like James at all. He said he couldn't leave Cubby. Yeah, we still hear Cubby's sad cries. We hear them late at night now. Mournful, lonely howls. James won't give up the search. When he hears the dog crying, he tries to track the puppy down. But he never finds him. At least, there haven't been any more nights like last Sunday. No more green vomit spewing into the sink. No more blood dripping from the ceiling. But we're nervous all the time. Whenever the house creaks, we expect something frightening to happen. As much as I try, I can't stop thinking about Mr. Lorry. I met him. I shook hands with him. How could he have hanged himself in her house 30 years ago? There has to be a logical explanation, right? Dad keeps saying he's going to find Mr. Lorry. He keeps saying that Mr. Lorry isn't dead... Is that it's all a trick by Mr. Lorry to run away with our money. But I don't think Mr. Stuyvesant in the library lied to us. Poor Dad. He isn't thinking clearly at all. At least Cody and I have been getting along pretty well. I haven't forgiven her for pretending to be a ghost and deliberately scaring me, but I've had to put my anger aside since we have so many real problems now. And I feel sorry for Cody. She's stuck hanging around the house all day while I go off to work. Mr. Hanker still comes by every morning and disappears into the basement. I guess he's still fighting rats. But no other work is being done. My job at the boutique is really fun. I've met some great people. And I even managed to go to the corner a couple of times to see Anthony. Anthony is a great guy. I haven't thought about Rick in ages. Tomorrow night will be our first date, too. We're supposed to go to the movies at the mall. I just had an idea about tomorrow night. I'm going to call Anthony right now and invite him to dinner. So I have to sign off for now. More tomorrow. Callie eagerly picked up the phone on her desk and punched in Anthony's number. It rang twice. Then Anthony picked up. Hi, Anthony. It's me, Callie. He sounded surprised to hear from her. What's up, Callie? 
I was just thinking about you, she said. Great. Then she heard him shout to his parents, Get off the line. It's for me. A loud click. Mom likes to listen in, Anthony said, chuckling. I keep telling her to get a laugh. Why don't you come over for dinner tomorrow night, Callie blurted out. You know, before the movie. Huh? You mean at your house? The invitation obviously caught Anthony by surprise. Yeah, she told him. We usually cook up a big pot of spaghetti on Saturday night. How about it? Well, the line went silent. Callie let out a forced laugh. Tough decision? And then she realized why Anthony was so reluctant. Anthony, what is your problem? She demanded. Are you really afraid of this house? Is that it? No. No way, he insisted. I'm not afraid. Really. Then you'll come? Great. Callie couldn't hide her enthusiasm. Maybe I'll bake a cake or something for dessert. Sounds good, Anthony replied. What time? Come about six, Callie told him. She thought she still heard some doubt in his voice. You're not really afraid to come here, are you? No, of course not, he replied. Nothing bad will happen, I promise, Callie said cheerfully. But as she said the words, she felt a chill of fear, and she found herself wondering, is that a promise I can keep?